Um, I suppose I better ask whether we're going to see some kind of Bitcoin or crypto uh, spike before the end of Christmas, given the Chinese Communist Party seems to have reversed its decision. Uh, they're going to have some kind of referendum, really, on whether uh, uh, to uh, use Bitcoin or certainly allow mining of Bitcoin in, in uh, the largest PPP GDP country in the world. Um Yes, I think there's a mass scale adoption going on. So just for people to frame what's really going on here, this is the internet back in 1997 had 150 million users. It was growing at 63% a year. It was the fastest adoption of any technology the world had ever seen. We're all kind of familiar with that story. Crypto currently has 150 million users. The adoption rate is 113% a year. So it's basically twice as fast as the fastest adoption of any technology in all recorded history. So it's happening at lightning pace. Everybody is coming into the space, the institutions, the sovereign wealth funds, retail investors from ETFs, nation states, everybody. Um, so I do think the price continues to spike significantly, not only into the year end, but probably into the first half of next year too. Right, now let's get to the dangers of ETFs. How, how dangerous is it that uh, exchange traded funds are involved in cryptocurrency, which was seen by idealists as breaking the power of central banks. At top level, I don't mind. It's adoption. It's still adoption. It's not in the way that the idealists would believe, which is not your keys, not your coins. I store them yourself, much like you do with gold bars. But it allows people access to this revolutionary technology and the returns that can come from it. The problem is it was done suboptimally. It was actually benchmarked against a futures contract. So a futures contract is something that is about the future price of an asset, and it doesn't have to stay in line with the actual price of Bitcoin. And what happens is when you get a lot of demand for the futures contracts, it trades at a huge premium, which means that you're actually lowering your return. So a lot of people are going to come here and see, oh, well, Bitcoin was up 100% in the last quarter, and they'll suddenly see that they made 30%. It's the same with the USO oil ETF. It's based on a futures contract. So it doesn't actually represent the underlying. So people, even the SEC are saying they're trying to help people here. They're actually not. They're actually doing the opposite. They're exposing them to a risk that they don't understand, which is the premium and discount that futures contracts can trade at. They don't allow ordinary people to trade futures contracts, but they think it's okay to allow them to trade an ETF based on futures contracts. It's nonsense to me. There's no conspiracy here in a deliberate attempt by the Security and Exchange Commission. Uh, there's nothing in conspiratorial about deliberately creating some kind of uh, financial vehicle which will burn people, make them make them stop being interested <laughs> I mean, in crypto. The cynic in all of us would say they're probably aware of some of that. They know it's suboptimal. But I also understand the fact that the current system, the SEC and others don't know how to deal with the physical ownership part of Bitcoin for the ETF. Is that secure enough? Because what would be even worse is if they can't make it secure enough, and I think it is secure, but it's a, it's a false narrative, and that money got hacked, then suddenly there'll be no money left and everybody could lose everything. I, I think that's entirely wrong because there's very, very few hacks of any of the major exchanges. Everything has changed. This is not 2017 anymore, or, or Mt. Gox 2013. But part of me would say, yes, they kind of understand that people are going to get disappointed, but I don't think they're that Machiavellian. Gary Gensler, who, who runs it, uh, said, has warned that crypto is like the wild West. I mean, unwittingly, that may attract people in the middle America to, to it, but uh, there's something political uh, hear about statements coming from him and, and others uh, warning well, people against spot trading, clearly, or spot investments that you can do on the internet easily? Part of it is he's in his own political battle to who regulates this. So what he's doing is shaking the sabre, saying, somebody needs to regulate this and it's going to be me. At the same time, the CFTC are trying to do the same. The Fed are looking at other ways of regulating the OCC. So all of these agencies are fighting who's going to regulate it. Why? because they know it's big and it's power. So whoever gets it gets all the power. So I think that's fair. I think they're also looking at this with the eyes of a 1934 securities law, which is nonsense. What this really is, is real-time venture capitalism for the, for the everyday person. The everyday person has been shut out of the big opportunities because you have to be accredited. You need to go through a financial institution. There's barrier after barrier after barrier so only the rich people get access. This is what has to change within this. 
This is allowing, if you don't deal with them as securities, you're going to allow everybody to be able to participate in this kind of early stage VC where the big gains are. I think there's a big battle that's being drawn up. He is showing the hard line because that's how you negotiate. All trade negotiators, everybody does the same thing. No, never, never going to happen. Obviously, what happens is they, they reach a grand compromise. There's too much money in the space, too many young voters in this, too much innovation in this space for him to come down and say, we're going we're gonna to prosecute all of these tokens as securities. Everyone's going to prison. It's just never going to happen. So it's setting the battlegrounds for the fight that has to happen. Could uh, the very same vested interests in NATO nations not deliberately sabotage crypto by uh, quantitatively easing, uh, but to, to buy the market, buy the crypto market, just as they've uh, I, owned the uh, they will, currencies, fiat currencies? They, they, will buy ass, they will buy crypto assets over time. That is going to happen. Are they going to be a large enough participant because they've come in so late? to be able to manipulate that market or dampen the market like people say that happens with a gold market, I doubt it. Because this something is unique. This is a distributed network of owners around the world from 150 million people that will soon be a billion people. So their ability to control it is almost zero. It's a fascinating, fascinating space. It is really anti-establishment at its core and creates a new world based around kind of distributed ownership and proven ownership of assets that people can't mess around with. You can't but change wait, the supply. But wait, fearing the loss of power, could the Fed and the Bank of England not just buy all of it and uh, take the hit of the loss uh, and uh, make the public pay for it? It's potentially feasible if somebody will sell it to them. So, so it's, it's, actually, actually, it's actually pretty hard. If the central bank were found to be trying to pursue a strategy like that, nobody's going to sell them anything because th there is a core belief in this space that this is for the people and not for the governments. People don't mind if the governments participate in it alongside the people, but if the governments try and control it at the expense of the people, that will not wash. Do you think the Bank of England is going to take on the millennial voters? No, they're not going to do it. They're going to have to adapt. If they go to battle, they will go to battle. And we saw that recently with the US trying to put some regulations in, and like, millions of people wrote in to congressmen, senators, got involved in all sorts of groups. And I think DC was surprised at the strength of this movement and how much money's in it as well. But I do urge people to participate, just dollar cost average, put a little bit in, don't risk too much, don't use leverage, and just participate in something that could be the biggest thing any of us have ever seen. I think right now it's a two and a half trillion dollar asset class. Most of the major asset classes around the world, equities, bonds, um, um, real estate are between 150 and 350 trillion. So I think this goes to 200 trillion in the next 10 years. So that's a hundred X for an asset class. Mankind has never seen that before. So it's an opportunity for everybody because everybody can own 10% of their assets in this. Everybody, the richest and the poorest.